everyone to the Consciousness Cafe, and this is a co-hosted meeting with Metaphor.inc, which is the community for metaphysical and spiritual writers and people who are interested in writing in those genres. And this evening, we have two co-hosts from the Charlotte Readers podcast here in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's where I'm sitting. Uh, and I wanted to talk, I went to a workshop that they hosted a few weeks ago, and one of the things that I found is that a lot of the uh, fears and concerns and questions that people that are writing in, in our genre uh, espouse or talk about are the same ones that, you know, are general problems for writers in general, just problems for writers in general. And um, Sarah and Landis and another co-host on their team, Hannah, they have put together eight books that talk about writing, and they go all the way from learning how to write to writing, editing, publishing, and marketing. And I would really wanted to have them talk about that that whole process because they have gone through what is it? It's almost 350 podcasts now over four and a half years, and talking to over 500 people. Let me let me get it right: 33 states and five countries. So that's good. So uh, I'd, I'd like to welcome Sarah Archer and Landis Wade to the show. And um, we'll just have a few minutes of general conversation. I'll, I'll ask them about their podcast and about their books. And um, then a couple questions just generally about writing. And we'll open up the floor for anyone that wants to ask questions because, you know, as they said in their books, writing is as personal and as unique as each individual. So I, I don't want to presuppose that it, that I'll be able to represent the needs and desires and and interests of everyone on the call. So we'll we'll see what everyone has to say. So I'll, I'll start out, I guess, with Sarah. You're a screenwriter too, or you've done screenwriting as well as regular writing. What's different with that as opposed to the regular writing process? Um, there are a lot of differences. I've done fiction, I've done screenwriting, I've done poetry. So um, I have a pretty wide base of experience. I think with screenwriting, it tends to be a lot more plot focused because you have so much less time to tell your story. And, you know, if you if you read a book and then you watch the film adaptation of the book, a lot of times people are like, oh, the movie is not as good. And that's one of the reasons why people feel that way, I think, is because things always end up getting cut. Um, you have a lot less space to tell a story in on screen than you do in a book. So um, screenwriting is really great for giving you really disciplined uh, story skills and knowing how to just focus on the plot, move from one week to the next, keep the momentum going, um, and really get that strong structure down. Um, so screenwriters tend to outline. I know some fiction writers don't outline. They just kind of jump in and find the story as they go. You can't really do that with a screenplay. Most, most of the time you have to really um, be focused about the story first. And it's also very visual. Um, that whole rule that a lot of writers have heard of show, don't tell. In screenwriting, you have to do that. <laughs> you literally can't tell because you can't just talk to your reader the way that you can on the page in a short story or a novel. Um, so it kind of forces you to figure out how to put everything into the action and the dialogue and visuals that we're seeing, sounds that we're hearing. Um, so I think screenwriting is great practice. I think there's a lot that you can learn from it, even if your main focus is writing fiction. It really helps you hone certain skills that I think translate back into fiction as well. Well, that's cool. And and Landis, you bill yourself as a recovering trial attorney. And I noticed on on the books that I read, there were a lot of attorneys who were writers. And uh, I don't know if that was like your encore career. And then also I, I noticed uh, a lot of journalists too were writers as well. And is that something that that's a, a natural thing for people, for attorneys and for journalists is to become writers later on or to do it in, in conjunction with a regular job? So I joke that we have a quota. We only allow so many lawyers on the podcast. <laughs> Actually, um, I w I'm a recovering trial lawyer. I did that for 35 years, and um, I was looking to try to find a way to manage conflict, and what better way to manage conflict than to be in charge of it when you write about it, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to being involved in conflict on a daily basis. So I went from actually engaging in conflict on a regular basis to turning it into prose uh, in terms of writing. And uh, then uh, I started interviewing authors. And you're right, there are uh, a great number of 
writers out there uh, who started their careers as lawyers or journalists. It could be investigative journalism, could be long form, could be you know just the short news. It could be lawyers who are corporate lawyers or they're trial lawyers or whatever. But those both of those professions, like probably many people on this call, uh, you do a lot of writing. Okay. It's not necessarily the kind of writing that you might do if you write a novel or a screenplay, as Sarah mentioned, but uh, it's writing nonetheless, and it gives you discipline, which is one of the, I think, ingredients to whatever writing you take on is to have the discipline to sit in the chair and to, and to get it done. So I think when we see those people, I've always asked them, you know, I say, you know, well, what motivated you to write? Or what, you know, and they're always, like, well, you know, I had a story inside of me, and I needed to get it out, and that's kind of what I think most of us as writers think about, right? You've got something inside and you want to you get it out. And uh, the problem is that lawyers and journalists, and uh, I was, I fell into the same trap. Um, we don't know what rules there are uh, that we need to know, that we need to break until we mm. start studying some of the rules of craft, which is really one of the reasons, Mark, that I wanted to go back uh, with Sarah and Hannah's help and, and pull all this, all this nuggets of information from all these authors we ask questions about about how you do what you do because i wanted to actually you know, i can't remember all this stuff right i'm 65 <laughs> years old i gotta have something on paper so i went back and we pulled all these quotes and put them in these eight books and divided them into categories so that we could have sort of a reference point um and the interesting thing about it is everybody as you said earlier approaches it a little bit differently i mean there's some things that sarah and i would agree that are you know, constants throughout some of this process, but everybody has a little bit different way of, of of getting to the end result. So yeah, lawyers and journalists, you know, we we try to write novels too, but we come at it like everybody else. It's a learning process and I'm continuing to learn. Well, that's cool. Well, since we started talking about your podcast, I wanted to ask a little bit more about it. I'm putting the, the link to their podcast, charlottereaderspodcast.com in the chat. So if you want to uh, copy it off from there, but tell us about your podcast. I know you've been doing it for four and a half years, over 300 episodes. Um, and also tell us about the book you mentioned, or the books, the series of eight books, because that's what I really wanted people to uh, hear about and uh, find out about and discover, because I really think you guys have come up with something that's really good and it's a good way to present it all so that you can cover the gamut of all the different things that people do and let people pick and choose what they like. I'll let Sarah talk about the modern era of the podcast, which you call the Beyond 300 version. I struggled along by myself for 300 episodes, <laughs> and then I brought Sarah and Hannah on. But Sarah, you want to share a little bit about what we do now? Yeah, sure. So uh, when Lambda's founded the podcast, it was mostly just author interviews, kind of more in-depth um, each episode would be an interview of an author starting more kind of locally in Charlotte and then expanded out. And now we have authors from different states and even other countries. Um, and starting about a year ago in the Beyond 300 format, I joined and Hannah LaRue, who's a publicist, joined as a co-host. Um, so we're able to kind of bring different perspectives. And in addition to the author interviews, we also do um, craft discussions about different writing technique issues or sometimes marketing and how do you publicize your work as a writer. Um, we'll have tips from local organizations about writing, um, elevator pitches, which is fun. We can have anybody can send in their 30 second elevator pitch for their book and we'll play it on the show and talk about it a little bit. Um, and so we, we've kind of made it a combination of the author interview, but also a lot of resources for people who are writers themselves and wanting to develop their craft, as well as book recommendations. So if you're just an avid reader, we've always got tons of books that you can find mm -hmm. out about. Um, and we share all that in our newsletter too. So we like to, to put out the show, but also kind of be involved in building a writing community and putting together a, a blog that people can contribute to and getting involved with local writing organizations like the Charlotte Writers Club, which hosted the event that, that Mark found us at. So um, yeah, we're, we're really focused on writing community, which I think is something that is uh, a topic of interest to this group too, it sounds like. Yeah, it's ever evolving. Um, we're you know, we'll get through the summer here. We'll probably think about some tweaks we can make to it in the fall. But uh, as far as the books, to your question about the books, um, this was nagging at me after my novel came out last year. Um, I, I knew that uh, I had these 500 authors we'd interviewed. And I said, uh, I'm just going to have to sit down and start listening to these again to find out what everybody said. I, mean, I remember some things, but not to the extent of 
eight of these books, right, that have all, yeah. these, all these quotes in it. And so we went back and I started pulling it. And once I had it all together, I contacted Sarah and Hannah. I said, okay, we need to kind of organize these and figure out, you know. And, and interestingly enough, they did fall into some uh, in, neat categories. The first one, The Writing Life, which uh, you can download for free online um, on your Kindle uh, through Amazon. Uh, is kind of a collection of the thoughts of all, of all these authors on just what it means to be a writer. And then we started breaking it down into sort of uh, fundamental craft components. Like uh, I just started thinking, you know, how, how many times did I ask these authors and did Sarah and Hannah ask these authors, how did you learn to write? What did you do? Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole book called Learning to Write from all these many best-selling authors and sometimes debut authors. And then we have writing process and tools because who doesn't ask an author, mm -hmm. what's your writing process? You know, well, the book is full of writing processes and they're all different, you know, and uh, some people get up in the morning uh, when the sun's not shining and other people don't start writing until, you know, when the vampires start coming out or something <laughs> at night. So, you know, and we did that. And then we have storytelling, inspiration, research as a book. And then the fifth book is writing techniques and characters. It, it gets into all those questions we ask people about conflict and humor and memoir, you know, just the different uh, aspects of writing. And then we have one on writing community, revision, and editors, because a lot of these authors talked about community. And a lot of them talked about the revision process and working with their editors. And then one that I like, we call the emotional writing journey. It's the ups and downs of being an author. That's book seven. And the book eight is uh, publishing and book marketing, where we talk to these authors about you know, their uh, path toward getting their books into the world, whether it be traditionally with an agent, traditionally with an indie press they submit to, or as an independent author where they do it all themselves. And then the whole book marketing thing, that gorilla in the room, that elephant stomping on your chest telling you, please go out and market this. And you're saying, nah, I got to do something else. I got I guess, or I don't know how, or whatever. So a lot of perspectives on social media, how they love it, how they hate it. A lot of things about websites and just advertising. And so it's a, we put that last because we didn't want people to jump to the, <laughs> to the brass ring first, right? People want to know the shortcut. I don't want to do all this other stuff. I just want to know how to get my book sold out there, right? We put it as the eighth book. It comes out in October, um, but it's there for a reason. It's, uh, it's to help people through those questions that they have once they finish their manuscript. Yeah. Sir, you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think that pretty much covers it. We've, so there's eight books total. Um, I think we're up to book three has been released at this point, And then book four comes out on June 1st. And um, they're releasing at the first of the month, every month up through October. Um, the first one, as you mentioned, the ebook is free. Um, you can also buy paperback copies of all the books. Um, but yeah, if you're interested just in downloading the first one, The Writing Life, it's a great starting point. And, so many good quotes in there from, you know, everyone from uh, like Juan Rash, CJ Box, Joel McCorkle, Jason Mott, um, David Baldacci, just really, really good international bestselling authors, but also a lot of great North Carolina authors as well. That's cool. And I put a link to the book series in the chat as well. So if you want to uh, pull that down. And uh, like Landis was saying and Sarah was saying is the first uh, book is free as an ebook. So you can go to that page, download it, and you'll have it. Uh, you can get a printed copy too. And I have a printed copy just like these guys do. Although they have eight of them. I only have one. Yeah. I I have the ebook of the other two, but um, it's, it's all the same thing. And the quotes are really good. I was, I was going to say, in this first book, there was one quote that I read right up at the front and reminded me of a guy that I knew in college. And uh, the quote was, if you're sitting in Hardee's and somebody in the next booth is having an argument and you're a writer, you'll stay there and listen to the argument to see how it turns out. What you're listening to is the mechanism of a relationship. It's just all, all inspiring to know that there are these things called people, that they have relationships, and there's something going on between them. And if you can observe that and play around with it, as a, and you can observe it and play around with it as a writer. It's like being a crazy, crazy bird watcher. <laughs> and I know you guys, you, yeah. I mean, you guys have said this multiple times, but it reminded me of a guy I knew in college. He had written for national uh, magazines as like a 20, 22 year old. And he kept a notebook, a small notebook in his back hip pocket. 
and we would be having conversations and somebody would crack a joke and he says, yeah, that's funny. And he'd pull out his little notebook and he'd write that little joke down. <laughs> and that's how he would spice up his articles. And this guy, I mean, he, he was in like Rolling Stone and some of these other big, big magazines, that, that kind of class of magazine, but that's how he got his, his material. It was just everyday stuff. So uh, it just reminded me that, you know, things that happen every day can be fodder for writing. And yeah. uh, I, I don't know how that goes with everybody else, but I thought, you know, that's just a perfect example. That's great. And I think I love the bird watcher comparison. I would also say writers are like magpies. Like sometimes we're the bird. We love to just collect things here and there. We're always searching for like a, a phrase that somebody says or an interesting quirk that somebody has or watching people's relationships and how they interact. Um, and I think it's also so important to capture that and write it down. Like your friend did with writing everything down, jotting things in a notebook. Um, I was talking to someone the other day who's like, oh, my ex-girlfriend used to keep like a whiteboard in the shower so she could write down her shower thoughts and not forget them. And she was crazy. I'm like, no, that's actually a great idea. <laughs> like, I might try that too. <laughs> so yeah, you, you get these inspirations and then you have to catch them because sometimes you think, oh, that, that really strikes me. I'm going to remember it. And then, you know, two hours later, it's gone if you don't write it down. Yeah. So always write it down. And And I think you may think this is a little weird. There's a friend of mine who's an engineer, a retired engineer. And he put a microphone over his bed and set it to record whenever he spoke. And whenever he had a dream in the middle of the night, he would wake up, talk about the dream, and then go back to sleep. And he would play it back the next day. And that was the way he would capture all of his dreams at night. And that's I thought, great. you know, that's an engineer for you. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. But you're right. There's all these different ways to, uh, you know, give you ideas for books and stories and all the different types of things that you can write from uh, screenwriting as well as, you know, poetry, you know, it's, it's a whole big, it runs the whole big gamut. And I was going to say one thing that's unique about this group here um, with the metaphor.inc group is that we're writing in a, a genre that is not very big. Um, but a lot of the people are writing. And I, and I said this to Sarah before Landis came on is that they're writing autobiographical nonfiction for the most part. They're, they're trying to make sense of experiences that they've had. But many of them, many of us are, you know, we aren't authors. We, we never went to, we never went to get an English degree or an MFA or anything like that. So a lot of people have just done things by uh, hit and miss trial and error. Uh, and we're really babes in the woods when you sit there and think about all the different tools and all the different processes that that you can learn or or use or utilize, uh, how to outline your books, uh, how to use things like Scrivener's uh, in addition to Microsoft Word. There's all these things that people here don't really know. We're we're almost really just trying to soak up whatever we can to learn how to write better and to be more effective with our marketing and find the right publishers, all these different things that you write about in your books. And that's what I, I really felt was great about having quotes is that you can pick and you can pick and glean through all the different quotes. A lot of them are funny. They're interesting. They're insightful. But a lot of times they mention things that you'd never thought about. And I think that's the best way to learn. Uh, and, you know, is, is just to have it out there and, and you pick up what you like and what you resonate with. Yeah, you're talking about, uh, there, there's a section in book five, Writing Techniques and Characters is coming out in July that uh, has a little section on memoir, which is some of what you're talking about here because you're writing from your own experiences. But Judy Goldman, who's a local memoirist, she's the first quote in that section. She says, most memoirs seek to answer a simple, a central question, and you don't always understand what that question is when you first set out to write the memoir. Yeah, And I thought that was interesting because sometimes you have to write your way into both the question and the answer. And I like what Webb Hubble says. By the way, Webb Hubble used to be the attorney general, uh, assistant attorney general under Bill Clinton. He was disbarred. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to prison. He's a great interview. He's a great author. Uh, his first book was Friends in High Places, uh, sort of a twist on Garth Brooks's <laughs> Friends in Low Places song. Yeah. But he says, when writing a memoir... Don't take it easy on yourself. It won't be truthful. Mm. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you're writing your own story, your own autobiography. You, you kind of 
gloss it up, it's not going to ring true or be true for that matter. So, uh, and I think Judy Goldman also said, I don't know if it's in this book or another one, but she said, when you're writing memoir, you need to be twice as hard on yourself as you're on anybody else. And right. uh, that way your friends and relatives can't come back and get mad at you. All right. Yeah. And um, there, as you were think, as you were talking, I was sitting there thinking, I, I think it was a Tom Clancy quote. They said, what's the difference between reality and fiction? Yeah, fiction and, has to make sense. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. fiction has to make sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I yeah. thought, and and then also too, when you're writing nonfiction, you can write all these facts and figures. And I think this is where uh, a lot of people on this call would need some help. You can write factually and accurately, but you need to make it interesting to people. You yeah. know, and uh, that's where a, a lot of us need a lot of help. I think, uh, and then also to be able to write things to to make it clear and simple. Uh, a number of things that I think writers of all genres really have have that issue with. And maybe but, and maybe some of the people on the call may not. They may disagree with me, but uh, I'll, I'll let it go. Go ahead. There, there's a quote that I pulled out from book four that I thought was kind of relevant to all of this um, and to kind of the spiritual side of writing. Um, Mike Bond says, what counts is the emotional content, the incredible incredible spirit and hope and fear and dreams that we bring to every moment of our lives. I think fiction is truer than nonfiction if it's done well. So that kind of goes with what we were saying about um, fiction has to make sense, (laughs) even if real life doesn't. And I think that that's something that is universal across, you know, fiction, nonfiction, memoir, whatever genre you're writing. The emotional content is what really counts at the the most basic level and what is really going to reach your readers. Um, Even if you're writing something that is fantastical or you're writing something where you're maybe pulling from real life experiences that are different from what your readers have experienced, if you can communicate some sort of emotional, psychological truth that resonates with people that feels honest and authentic, I think that that's always going to be powerful. Um, And the first step to being able to be honest with other people in your writing is being honest with yourself. And sometimes that's really hard, you know, especially if you're writing about your own life experiences, it can be difficult to, to do that work and to really be honest about who you are and how you perceive the world and what you've experienced. Um, But I think that it's helpful to remind yourself at that stage when you're in a first draft that you're alone, no one is looking over your shoulder, like you can be as honest as you need to be on the page and then you can decide later if and what you wanna share with the world. So just give yourself permission to be totally honest in that first draft. And I I would add one thing to that. Fry Galliard, uh, American author, he. It's also a college professor. He's written a number of nonfiction books. So this is in line with what you were talking about, Mark, in terms of writing uh, mm-hmm. nonfiction. Um, here's a quote from one of the books. He says, Tom Wolfe, who wrote books like The Right Stuff, said that all of the possibilities that are open to the novelist or the poet are also open to the writer of nonfiction. You can develop character. You can deal in extended dialogue. You can develop a plot. And you can explore theme. Whatever it is that a fine novelist is doing, if you're working in these realms of nonfiction, that's available to you too. So to pick up on your point mm-hmm. earlier, that's just part of the process of learning some of these techniques. You've got a story, you've written the rough draft of it, you've gotten the facts of it, but now it's time to add a little dialogue. It's time to figure out what the themes are. I think Stephen King said that he doesn't write to a theme, but after he's written what he's written, he reads back through what he's written and he figures out well, what, what are the themes here And then he tries to flesh those out a little bit more. Um, So, you know, and then there's character. And you might decide if you've written nonfiction, okay, what part of this, uh, where is the central character here? Where are the competing characters? Where's the conflict in this nonfiction narrative? So that when people read it, they'll come away saying, you know, that was nonfiction, but it kind of read like a novel, you know? And Mm -hmm. and when they do that, they sort of uh, forget that they're reading about they're reading a story, right? And that's what it is. At the end of the day, it's storytelling. That's cool. And and I think those are important points and and uh, to draw people in. And I think that's something that really a lot of people need to need to understand. Sheila, you were going to say something. Yeah, I just want to uh, add a couple of things. This is a very interesting conversation. But when we were talking about memoirs, um, you know, the one thing that popped up in my mind was a theme. And if you're writing about yourself and your life, certainly there are lots of different tentacles that reach here and there. 
But if you come back, if you have a central theme and everybody has their own personal central theme, if you think about that and come back to it, um, either, you know, several parts in the book or at the end of each chapter, it kind of helps the information to flow and to, to tie, to be tied from one chapter to the next. Um, so there's a connection there. And um, I think theme is, is quite important, especially in memoirs, to hold it all together. Um, and the other thing I was, this is a little bit humorous, but when we were talking about going out to dinner and eavesdropping on the next mm -hmm. conversation, um, my energy healer who lives in New Jersey and I used to go out to dinner and we talk about things involving energy healing which has its own sort of language and its own sort of lingo and there are terms that you use and it, you know, and often we would pause and say, gee, I hope the people sitting next to us are <laughs> listening to this conversation because they'll think we're completely crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there are things that you can pick up. And I had to laugh when, when that was brought up because I think we all are people watchers to some degree. If you're a writer, you're a people watcher and you're, mm -hmm. You're a little bit nosy. You want to know what's going on. So I think that's an important key also that we are observers. And it's it's very um, important to be a keen observer at times. Yeah. Just not don't eavesdrop on energy healing. <laughs> You're <laughs> going to know what's going on. So and you, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Landis. No, I was just saying, and you mentioned, you know, one of the challenges, Laura King Edwards, who wrote a memoir about her younger sister who came down with a disease that took her life before she was 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. But uh, interesting th story there because uh, it, her, her sister slowly became blind and but she wanted to run and she joined girls on the run and she ran with a partner and, you know, with a tether, she was blind and so forth. Uh, so Laura started running marathons in her honor. I think she's around about 30 in 32 states now. But one of the things she said about writing the memoir, which I think might, but sometimes I think about this too in writing novels or even short pieces. She said the most difficult piece when you're writing a memoir is trying to determine what details to include, what scenes to include, and what not to include. In other words, what's going to be meaningful to the reader. So it's, and that's, we got a whole book on revision and editing, right? But that's the whole process of trying to hone down this draft of, of something you put together so that the reader comes away um, you know with their own experience from what you've written about yourself yeah and I think that's a common problem that new writers have is they write for themselves instead of for the readers and you're really writing for the readers and trying to interest in them in what you're saying and uh, a lot of people forget that and and you say a lot of different aspects of that in your books as well you know, about how some novels end abruptly or how people don't make things interesting and you just lose lose your interest in it. And I think all those are valid things that people need to think about when they're writing. And and new writers, especially ones that are are in this genre, don't really have access to all the the other people to emulate, you know, the other uh, successful authors. And I know that's one of the things that you talk about. Um the degrees to uh, understand how to do creative writing, how to do, you know, things that could lead to writing a novel, like being a journalist or, or doing different types of writing that would hone your craft and hone your, hone your skills. They just and don't. I, and, I'll, and I'll add one thing, Mark, to this, that might be helpful to folks. It's uh, it's what my editor um, and Sarah's heard me talk about this um, says are her four main points. She, she doesn't care whether I put her picture on the dartboard and throw darts at her, but it's add, subtract, reorder, and clarify. Mm. So you take your manuscript, you add the things that give it color and context, you subtract the superfluous and those darlings you need to kill, right? Um, and you reorder things because you want to start in the middle of the action. Even though your story does have a beginning, a middle, and an end, don't bore us with the with the boring beginning, <laughs> you can give some of that to us in the backstory, perhaps, even if it's nonfiction, and then clarify, because if the reader doesn't understand it, whose fault is it? It's not the reader's fault. It's my fault, the writer's fault, right? right? 
So I used to have this fun argument. I say, what do you mean, Nor? You don't understand what I'm writing. And then a kid, I said, okay, I'll fix it. If you don't understand it, then it's probably my fault, right? <laughs> and Sarah, you've dealt with those kind of issues with your editors and the whole screenwriting process, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that this, especially talking about memoir or any writing that's based on your personal life, this is one of those areas where working with an editor or a beta reader or a critique group, however it is you're getting your feedback is so invaluable because especially if you're writing about yourself and your life, I mean, we all think our own lives are interesting, right? And, and they are. Everybody's life is interesting if you really get into it and all the ins and outs of what makes a person who they are. Um, but I think it can be difficult for a lot of people writing memoirs or personal essays to sort of pick and choose and to define that theme like Sheila was talking about and knowing kind of the line between an autobiography where you're just sort of writing everything that's happened to you versus a memoir where there's one specific story that you're telling and one specific topic that you're addressing um, and getting feedback from an editor or a beta reader or just whoever it is who you're sharing your work with, um, that can allow you to see what readers are really responding to, interested in, and make your cohesive story out of that that revolves around one theme. So I think when you're in the first draft, it's okay to kind of write for yourself and just put out there whatever you think is interesting, but then it's really helpful to find that community and, and get help, whether it's a professional editor you're hiring or friends you're sharing your work with, um, and get that feedback and really use that to hone your work down. And one thing to remember about memoir, I haven't written a long memoir, I've written shorter pieces, but this clicked for me when somebody told me this. They, they said, look, this is not supposed to be an encyclopedia. This is not supposed to be Reader's Digest version of your life or even a chapter in your life. It's supposed to be about your revelations about those things that happen in your life that people can then take mm. and apply them to their own lives. So what you're doing is you're you're looking at your situation uh, through a lens of the person that you are now, the more mature person, hopefully, that, that we are now than we were when these things, and ha and if we'd have written it 10 years ago, our, our thoughts and perspectives on it might have been different than they are now. And it's those revelations about the experience that will connect with the readers, because they don't have to have had your experience, but if they hear you you're reflecting on it, then they can use that reflection to reflect on their own experiences. Right. And and I think you can bore them with the details of what your experience actually right. was. So that is very important. So you made me think um, we have some people who are, are budding writers on the call. And if someone has had an experience that they want to write about, but they haven't uh, gone through the process yet, what would be, let's say, three recommendations that you would make to uh, a new a new writer for how to uh, write something and get it published? Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it, sir? Yeah. I know. Yeah. How many um, episodes on this topic and how many books have we written? Uh, uh, well, yeah, it'd be by your books first. <laughs> uh, one one thing right? that we say, and so that I'll just say one, you say one, I'll say whatever. But the first thing is to read a lot. You know, mm -hmm. uh, most writers, uh, it's funny, uh, somebody said, I remember they're telling, they said, well, I want to write a book. And they said, well, do you read a lot? And they go, no, I don't, I don't read a lot. I don't like to read. And they said, well, then you shouldn't be writing a book. You know, so if, if people read a lot, they're going to, through osmosis, absorb, uh, you know, some things about writing. Uh, they're not going to get it all right, but that's going to be a start. Just reading in different genres, reading, that's the first start to getting published and to writing a book is being an avid reader. It doesn't matter what you're reading, you know, what your genre is, but it does help to read. It certainly helped me to start reading a lot of books outside what I normally read when I did the podcast, uh, it sort of broadened my perspective and taught me some things. Sarah, you throw out a point here. Yeah, I think that that's first and foremost always is just read as much as you can. Um, I think another thing that's really helpful is to figure out your writing process and schedule. Writing takes time. And I think that's one of the biggest struggles for so many writers, even full-time writers who don't have another job. We'll talk about how they struggle to find the time, but also the discipline to sit down and devote time to writing. Um, it's just, it's something that is almost universal is, is trying to make that time and space where you can just focus on your writing. Um, so I think 
playing around with your process, whether it's trying writing at different times of day or writing at home versus out in a space where maybe there's some kind of white noise in the background, like a coffee shop. Um, try writing on a laptop versus writing longhand. Uh, just figure out kind of what your process is and also how you're going to schedule your writing into your life and make it a priority. Because I know, at least for me, I can always find other things to do as opposed to writing. <laughs> there's always going to be something that's easier and that feels more um, kind of doable and approachable than sitting down and writing. So I have to make myself have the discipline to kind of get in the seat and do the work. Um, and we've had uh, people talk about this on the podcast and about how you have to sometimes consciously think, okay, what am I going to give up to make up time for writing? Is it watching one less hour of TV? Is it, um, you know, spending less time on a, a certain hobby or something? But if you even make small bits of time in your schedule, as long as you're doing it consistently, it can really add up and you can get a lot done. Even if you're writing 15 minutes a day, you're still going to see some progress over time and you're keeping your work fresh in your mind. So your subconscious is kind of thinking about it, even when you're not sitting there um, actively working on it. So I think that's a big thing too, is figuring out where you're going to find the time and how you're going to do the actual mechanics of your process. All right, we're ping ponging here. So the question has to do with, you know, getting something published. I'm going to throw out something that seems a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, writing is really kind of a team sport. You need to... Mm -hmm. You need to get involved in your writing community. You need to join writing groups. You need to volunteer to be involved in the writing or organizations like this to talk about writing or other writing groups talk about writing. Start to meet people that are in the industry um, and they will tell you things and you will learn things by getting to know them. And then when you volunteer in those organizations, you'll also uh, learn more as well. I started out with the Charlotte Writers Club Went to a couple of meetings. They said, we need somebody to be the program chairman. I said, I really don't have time. I'm, I'm practicing law, but I will. And started meeting these writers because we go to dinner before they spoke, right? And I picked up things. And so I did that for two or three years and helped the writing organization. And I joined other organizations. And, you know, you just start making connections. And just think about it. You're not thinking now about who's going to blurb your book when it finally does come out five years from now. Mm -hmm. But when you made those connections four or five years ago in those writing organizations, you met an author here. You did something for an author there. You supported them at their book signing. It's going to come back to you uh, when the time comes to help promote your own book. It's a, it's a small thing. It's a, it, you're not doing it for that necessarily. It just happens because you're part of a community. So I would say in addition to reading, doing what Sarah says, getting a writing practice, you know, join a writing community and be involved in a writing community. There's more, Sarah. <laughs> well, I think that, that that's a great point. And something that you can do that's kind of in tandem with that networking and building your community is thinking about how you're going to market your work and market yourself more broadly as a writer. And there's kind of different opinions about where in the process you do this. Is it a good idea to think about marketing when you're in the early stages or does that kind of get in the way of your creativity? Um, do you want to think about it later on when you're actually, you know, in the lead up to publishing a book? But wherever in the stage you start thinking about that, um, think about how you brand yourself and how you brand your book and what are the selling points other than just I wrote this and it's good. Like that's, there's so many books out there that that's not enough. You have to know who your audience is um, and how you can pull on maybe specific themes or topics or events that are encapsulated within the book to market your work. Um, and we've talked about this on the show, like how do you get kind of creative with your marketing? Like Landis wrote Daily Decor Declarations, which is historical. Well, it's, it's not really historical fiction, it's contemporary, but it has to do with a historical mystery, a true story in Charlotte. So you've done a lot of events that cater to historical associations and um, that pull the real history in and the real settings in the book in a fun way into your marketing as opposed to just going to bookstores. Um, and we've talked to writers who will, will say like, well, my book is about, uh, has to do with a chef. So, so I did events at um, cooking supply stores and farmers markets and, and brought in the kind of food and recipe angle. So think about what are the things that are in your book that you can pull out for the marketing and, and reach out not just to other writers for your networking, but also to people within those communities. Um, so if you're writing in the sort of spiritual realm, maybe reaching out to spiritual organizations and people who might be interested in that side of it, in addition to other writers. And I think that's a good part of the kind of community building process. It's not just 
connecting with readers and writers, but also connecting with people who might be interested in the subject matter of your book. And I'll add one last one, so we'll have five here. So we asked this question on the podcast uh, to all of our authors. If you could tell your younger writing self something of mm -hmm. value that had you known it uh, when you got started, uh, based on all your experience that you have now, what would it be? And very consistently, we get uh, answers that have something to do with the word patience. Um, people uh, want things to happen yesterday, and you know you want to you want to be successful sooner rather than later. You want to get that publishing contract. You want to get that agent. You want to get that even independently published book out sooner rather than later. And a lot of these authors talk about being patient. They said, look, if I'd have just been more patient, had more faith in myself. And realize that this is a long game and not a sprint, uh, I'd have been better off. And, you know, uh, one of the authors who had a sense of humor said, look, if, you're, if, if your expectations are reasonable, lower them. <laughs> and, and if you do, you won't quite be as surprised about what happens later. And Steve Berry, who uh, I've had him on the podcast several times, he is a thriller writer. He sold more than 30 million copies of books. He was a lawyer at one time uh, and he wanted to be a writer. And, it, and he said, he got so many rejections of his books and that's something else you gotta be prepared for is rejections. It wasn't until the 85th time that he submitted something that someone took a nibble at it. He said he was an overnight success, but it took 12 years to get there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's um, it does go back to writing somewhat for yourself, but also being prepared uh, to accept the fact that there's all different kinds of ways to define success. Um, and if you find success in a way that suits you, uh, you know, spiritually, whatever, um, then you can be happy with the result. But patience is, is definitely one of the five things I would include in terms of what you need to do to be a published author. There you go. And um, you're you're making me think of of one other thing. And son of a gun, if I forgot it while you were talking, but um, it'll um, come back to me. <laughs> it'll, it'll come back to me. But uh, it was it was oh I know what it was. Um, a lot of people that that I talk to in in this genre, they're afraid of what other people will think. Mm, yeah. And that was one of the things that really hit me when you guys were talking in your workshop is that it was the same thing that writers in general have, you know, they have the same problem, the same fear. And, you know, I know one person who likes to out these people, he likes to invite them to, uh, you know, be a guest on his show. And then he has them sit there and talk, 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 talk until, you know, they start feeling comfortable about things. But uh, you almost have to be shoved out into the limelight when you're a first author, a first writer. Well, you, you know, one of the things you said there about criticism, uh, external criticism, you know, it could be reviews about your book online. The thing to remember is that, and it took me a while to realize this, um, you know, when you're first writing, you, you, you want your book to be received, read by everyone, right? I mean, when the publicist asks you, well, who's your book for? And you say, well, it's for all readers. Well, no, it's not. People like to read different things, right? You may be the best writer in a particular genre, uh, but somebody doesn't like to read that genre. It might even be your best friend, it might be your spouse. You know, yeah. they don't like to read the kind of thing that you're writing. So the fact that somebody doesn't like your work doesn't mean that your work doesn't have value. Uh, it's just a matter of connecting with the readers that uh, connect with the kind of things that you like to write about. That's cool. So, yeah, I, I think that just quickly piggybacking off of that, I think one thing that's helpful there is to kind of figure out who your readers are, your first round of readers before you start to publish something and make sure you have some really supportive people in there. Like, I know that I have people who will give me notes who are really blunt and to the point and will really dig in with the criticism, but I also have people who are much more supportive <laughs> and who I know reliably I can go to and give my work to them and they'll give me critiques, but they'll, they'll always be like my kind of cheerleaders too. Um, and so it's helpful to have that and have that be sort of like a buffer, especially in your first round of getting notes to help keep you motivated and keep you thinking, okay, there's something here that's worth pursuing. Um, if you have people who are really harsh readers and they're like your first round of notes, sometimes it makes you feel like, why am I even doing this? So uh, you kind of figure out who your, your first line readers are and, and go to them as your support system. There are people out there that, who will do nothing other than try to find 
a way to bring other people down who mm -hmm. work hard on a project uh, who don't write much themselves, but they just go and they give these one and two star. I had somebody, uh, I read a series of books about lawyers who represent people who think they work for Santa Claus, kind of a cross between my cousin Benny, America on 34th Street. And they got some decent reviews. People liked them. One person was offended by the fact that the plot in the third book had to do with global warming. And so they gave me a one star review. And they said uh, this was the book that Al Gore would read to their grandchildren, you know, and, you know, it had nothing to do with the content of the writing, nothing to do with the story itself. It was just they just didn't like what they viewed to be a political message because I had the North Pole melting. Right? I mean, it's going to happen, folks, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, and they didn't like that and they and they critiqued it. Well, people are going to find a critique in your work no matter what you do. And a lot of times um, it's hard. You, you, it's hard sometimes that criticism will stay with you longer than five or six uh, people who say what how much they loved your work. It shouldn't be that way, right? And I try to discipline myself to balance that out, you know, and it all comes down to, again, finding, uh, you know, those those groups of readers uh, that you can connect with. But Sarah's right. You should actually find a group of beta readers um, before you have an editor that will give you honest feedback um, so that you can take it and make your work better and then get an editor who's going to do like mine and tell you, Randish, you need to work more on this. You know, this is this, this can be better here. You can just work a little bit harder. Yeah. I'm good. So we're at a point where, um, you know, we we're at the end of this conversation time, and I'd like to invite people who are listening to uh, come off mute. And if you'd like to ask some questions, let's just have an open conversation with uh, Sarah and Landis. And I know you each have different perspectives from, you know, what we've talked about. I'd like to hear what your thoughts and comments are. So if anybody likes to would like to say anything please uh, feel free to speak up. Go ahead. Well, I, if I could throw out a question for y'all, um, and then if anyone else has questions too, we can keep it going. But one thing that I'm interested in from anyone on the call is if you're writing about, I think a lot of this group is kind of about spiritual and metaphysical experiences that you're writing about. Um, and I would imagine that a lot of that is being drawn from maybe dreams, maybe meditative states, maybe um, spiritual or religious experiences that you've had, you know, things in your life where you're in sort of a maybe state of awareness or consciousness that you're not normally in. Um, so I'm interested if any of you, if you're writing about things like that, how do you get to that in the writing? Like, do you ever find that there's, I experienced this thing and now I'm trying to write about it and I'm in, in a different frame of mind and you're trying to sort of recreate that state of mind when you're in the writing process and how do you translate that? Um, I can contribute a bit. Um... Uh, just to reiterate, uh, I, my book is historical fiction, but it has threads of metaphysics running through it. And uh, I find uh, that, you know, some of the, thing, the metaphysical things are useful as far as character development, because I sort of stumbled upon this, but I was writing and I thought, hmm, a tarot read here would really introduce this character, because... If you if you lay out like a Celtic cross and you go through it, you can pull out aspects of that character's um, situation at the present time. And this was the introduction to this character. And then, uh, you know, the last card that comes up is the tower, which means, you know, this is going to be uh, disruptive in our life. What's going to follow is going to be disruptive. So it's a good way to sort of introduce a character. And the other thing I realized was you can have your character, and I, I did this for um, Elijah. Uh, Elijah is the main character in my book, but his mother was going through a hard time, and she went to a seer and was asking advice about how to, uh, she had she's going to have a dual role, one in the company and one in raising a son, and she was a little nervous. So uh, I got to incorporate this message was actually channeled. I channeled this message and it was beautiful. It wasn't, you know, it's a different style from me. I knew it didn't come from me, 
but I wanted to include it in the book. So some of those experiences you can include as the story evolves. And I found, a, you know, there's opportunity throughout when you're writing a story to sort of implement those sorts of things. And this is fiction, of course, but even if you're writing about your own experiences, you can just include uh, some of those um, events that have happened in your life. Yeah. And uh, I'll add one other thing, too, that's specific about this group, the Consciousness Cafe and Meta Metaphor.inc group, is it has a number of practitioners in, in it. You know, it, it, aren't, it isn't people who have had one experience or two experiences, it's people who practice it every day and uh, who have an intimate knowledge of and a very detailed knowledge of a lot of different aspects of things. So this is an unusual group. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to form Metaphor.inc. And uh, it's so when people want to write in this genre, you can be able to tap into people who have had similar experiences or have the knowledge that could give you the comments that would mean something, you know, whereas other people may not have the same experiences or the same type of understanding that people in this group would have. But we're, we're primarily practitioners. A lot of people are practitioners. And I would offer that um, writing about some of these things is probably as difficult as trying to explain a very profound dream or work of art or poetry that is very affecting or a piece of music. So it's these experiences are, are very intimate and then finding the language to express that level of it or that intimacy and the experience um, I think can be somewhat challenging in that in that regard. Yeah. And and also too, in this meeting, we're kind of crossing silos. That was one thing that kind of hit me as as I was prepping for this, is that we're in, you know, people who write in in these genres are in one silo. And uh, Sarah, you and Landis are in another silo. So in a way, we're kind of like crossing silos in this instance. You know, so things that make sense to us may not make sense to you and vice versa as well. Uh, so this, I think it's an important meeting uh, for us to have, but it's it's also one that we may need to, as Landis, as you were saying, you know, too, is we need to clarify as one of those four points. You know, mm -hmm. if you guys have questions that you don't understand some of the, or the extent to some of the things that we say. Um, it would be good to, to ask us to do that. Also, too, you know, a lot of things that people know here, people on this call know or that people write about, uh, a lot of it's dismissed by people in general or the mainstream in general. But uh, to the people that do this writing, these these are things that happen to them. These are experiences that they've had and um, or things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis things that they do to help other people or consult with other people and stuff like that so they do a lot of things but a lot of the works that people write uh, are not covered or are not of interest to people in the general communities so that's one thing that we have to fight with or you know conversely we'll just keep our books in inside the same silo you know marketing to the people who would be interested in it and not trying to go outside of it uh so when people do try and cross those boundaries i think it's it's significant but i think it's something that needs to happen because without crossing the silos people just stay where they are and we need to do something to enhance that or change that Hey, this this is Wanda. Uh, can may I ask a question, sort of along those lines, um, just you know, right on topic with what you're saying. I, you know, I'm curious if there's any recommendations on editors and publishers um, around those topics, around these topics of spiritualism and, and metaphysics uh, that you all might have. You know, a lot of people are doing like self publishing through Amazon, so I'm also curious your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, we have a resource list on the metaphor.inc website. It's metaphor.inc, and uh, metaphor stands for metaphysical author. It's kind of a mashup of those two words. But if you go to the resource page on that website, it'll give you a, a short list of people that we've worked with who have some experience in the spiritual and metaphysical background or genres. 
Yeah, I would also say one of the, the best ways to start finding resources is to look at books that you've enjoyed or books that are similar to what you're writing or similar to what you're trying to publish. Like I know for me, when I was starting my process of trying to get published, I started by querying agents. And my starting point with that was looking at books that I thought were similar in some way to the, the manuscript that I had written or that might appeal to a similar audience. And then looking, and usually you can see this in the acknowledgments of the book, who was the agent of that author, and then looking up the agent and reading on their website or their social media, trying to find out more about them and what they're interested in. Um, and then usually, you know how it is on Google, like you, you read one thing and then it leads you to something else and you find this agent and then you find this other person at their company. And so that was a good way to kind of find um, resources that were helpful to me. So maybe that would be a helpful starting point is just looking at books that are similar to what you're writing and, and those publishers and agents who represent those authors would be a good place to start. Um, Landis has experience with independent publishing, so he can, I'm sure, talk to that yeah. process and what that's like. So, but that's a good point about the acknowledgements because the, the author usually thanks their editor as well. And, and I've had people find editors by looking in the acknowledgements of books, uh, say you're writing a mystery, a local mystery writer and who was their editor and they connect that way and by talking to other authors uh, at these community writing events that you go to um, who's your editor how broad do they edit do they do these kind of things and maybe they don't but they know somebody who does so that's a way to connect with editors as far as independent publishing goes um, yeah don't um, it, you, there can be a uh, sometimes a bad rap uh, and this is a sort of sometimes a top-down thing from the tradi traditional side because think about it, um, indie publishing is a threat to traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. So traditional publishers are not always going to be kind when they talk about indie publishing. They're going to say, ah, well, they couldn't get an agent or they couldn't get published or it's not as good a writing. So there are all kinds of awards being won out there by indie authors. Uh, the, the trick is to make sure you just don't take the shortcut and upload your manuscript on mm -hmm. Amazon. You know, that you actually go through the process to make your book feel and act and smell like what would happen to it if it went through a traditional process. And I tried to do that with my last novel, even to the point of when it was finished, holding off for eight months before it was published so that I could put together an active marketing plan mm -hmm. and line up all the places I was gonna be. A lot of people don't have that patience. They'll finish it, they'll get it edited, and they'll upload it, you know, right away to Amazon or whatever. And remember that there's more places out there than just Amazon. It is the 800-pound gorilla, but you might want to think about, you know, having your book on Ingram Spar because that way it can get into bookstores. Uh, they can order direct from Ingram Spark if it goes there. And bookshop.org, which goes out to all indie stores, will pick it up. If it's in Ingram. So um, it's not just a matter of, you know, when people say self publishing, the knee jerk reaction is, oh, well, they uploaded their book on Amazon. And that can be true, and it should be if you do it right. But uh, it, it's a process that should be followed just as rigorously as the one, and be proud of it because there are a lot of traditionally published authors that are giving up working with traditional publishers mm -hmm. because they write faster than they're willing to publish their books. You know, and they're and some of them are making a lot more money now. And, and money is not necessarily the thing, but some, you know, there are a lot of indie authors we interviewed on the show. Particularly, if uh, maybe if y'all come up with a category that is metaphysical romance or something, you, you probably make a lot of money, right? Because there are a lot of romance readers out there, uh, and there's probably even a category out there about that. I don't know, but uh, a lot of them are going indie for the very reason that they put out more books that a traditional schedule would put out books. So in the traditional world, they might put you on a cycle of every 18 months or two years, if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And some of these can put them out a lot sooner. So a lot of options. The great thing is there are a lot of options. If you, if you, if the gatekeepers keep you out, uh, you can still do it the right way, spend a little money, uh, get your book published and slowly build your backlist because your backlist, uh, somebody asked me, so, you know, how do, how do you make money as an indie author selling books, I said, well, I don't know, I hadn't made much money yet, but I'll tell you this, it's not the first book and it's not the second book. It's gonna be the third or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth that I write that's gonna, gonna make some money because I'll have that backlist. Right. And um, 
Also, too, when when you were talking about about this, you were making me think about people who write in this genre. Uh, they could expand the work that they do, kind of like what Sheila's doing. And Sheila, I'm going to put you on the spot. Is is you have a a historical fiction novel, but it has some metaphysics running through it. And that's maybe a way that people can expand out of this genre into other genres with some of the experience and knowledge that they have. Yeah, um, thanks for that. I I do have a few comments about um, mixing genres. Um, my book is actually listed as historical fiction, which is right. But I knew going out that it would be hard to find an agent who would want to be involved in something that uh, is historical fiction with metaphysical themes running through it because there's no category for that. So um, I chose to self-publish and my book is on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, Google Books and Ingram Spark. And um, some months after it went live, um, an organization picked it up and wanted to um, to help me get the word out about it. And they put me in charge with, this is how I got the CBS radio interview. And also um, there, they have prepared a movie script that they're presenting to production companies for the book. And all this is is something that I didn't go after. These people found me. I did ask them, I said, how did you find this book? And they said, we went out to the Library of Congress and we reviewed lists and we went to book list and we we bring back books to our staff. Our staff reads them and they say, go or no go. And at that point, they will assist you and get you out there. Um, I also do my own marketing and I find that Western Europe is uh, probably my broadest audience right now. So that's interesting. I think you have to experiment with the marketing <laughs> and I think you have to experiment with who your audience is going to be because you never know. You never know who's going to turn up and you never know who's going to be interested in your book, by the way. So, yeah. And just one of one of the little tips that I found out, and this is not something that I don't know if if you've acknowledged Landis and Sarah, is that the way you've rolled out your books is that each month you roll out a book, it puts that book on the new uh, new entries or new new book lists on Amazon. So over the course of eight months, you're going to be on that new entries or new new listings uh, list for your entire series. So uh, that was something that somebody told me they're they're doing like five ebooks and they're releasing an ebook every month, and that way they get you know, all that coverage is free marketing because Amazon changes their uh, SEO uh, search engine options or, you know, so that uh, it gets a higher higher push than other people. Yeah, that's, that's a great point with Amazon. I think just in general too, it, it points to how you have a lot of natural momentum when your book is a new release. Um, and so kind of like Landos is saying, it's good to plan ahead and not just release your book right away as soon as it's ready. Like, take the time to have a marketing plan and have a lead up and um, schedule promotional opportunities before your book comes out. Because then when it's new and it's a, a new release, you get that extra push from places like Amazon. It's easier to promote with places like BookBub or even on social media. Um, people are gonna pay more attention when your book is just coming out. So make sure that you have kind of the groundwork laid up in, in the lead up to your release so that you can really take advantage of that first month or two after the book comes out. There you go. Leslie, did you have a question? I think you had come off mute a couple times. Oh, I just wanted to um, say that I put the link to that page on Metaphor.inc into the chat if anybody's interested in looking at it. The resource page that Rhonda asked about. I also added a link in the chat for um, an interview that Landis did with Jennifer Ruff who is a, a, an indie published author. And there's a lot of really good kind of um, technical information in that interview about the nuts and bolts of indie publishing and how she actually markets and makes money off her books. So um, that's a good one to check out if you're interested. That's good. I, Sarah, I think it's interesting that you got picked up by national book publishers with your first book. 
And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, I guess, a, a testament to how you've written, but uh, also it's just like the difference between an enlisted officer in the military and an officer mm -hmm. or an enlisted, what, non-commissioned non officer and an enlisted, uh, or you know what I mean, a regular officer. It's like a whole different class, whole different thing. So did you have to get an agent to uh, mm -hmm. help with the marketing to pitch to those people? Or how did you go about doing that? Yeah, yeah, I really did it in a very traditional way. Like I, um, I didn't have any experience with publishing or any knowledge of it or any connections or any any of that. Um, it was the first book I had written, so I didn't really know how anything worked. <laughs> so I just googled information about like can you get an agent and found examples of query letters and then found agents to reach out to. Um, and I spent a couple months querying agents and then got an agent um, at an uh, agency in the UK. And um, then I did a round of revisions with her and her assistant who gave me some notes. And then she sent the book out on submission to publishers and then um, Putnam picked it up. So then I did a further round of revisions with my editor there. And from the point that that final manuscript was accepted, it was, I think, about another year before the book actually came out. Mm -hmm. So then they took it about a year to do the copy editing and designing the cover um, and starting with their marketing plans and all of that. So I I think that I was very fortunate to get traditionally published by a major publisher right out of the gate. And there are a lot of things that are great about that. Um, it's easier to get your book into bookstores. It's easier to reach audiences, uh, kind of a wider audience. Like my book was translated into multiple languages and published in other countries. Um, it's been option for TV. So it's in development and other, other media as well. Um, and also, especially for me, as somebody who had no experience and didn't know anything about book marketing, it was nice to have a team there who could help kind of take care of everything and I could rely on their expertise. But you also give up a lot of control when you're doing traditional publishing versus indie. Um, like they sort of steered the book in a creative direction that they wanted and then follow that direction for the, the title that they chose, the cover that they chose, the audience that they were marketing it to. All of that was stuff that I was not really part of that decision. So once they buy the manuscript, they kind of take it and run with it and do what they think is going to make them the most money. So as a writer, you don't really have as much creative input at that point. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe if you're an experienced author and you've been working with them for years and you've made them a lot of money, <laughs> you might have a little bit more say, but certainly as a debut author, they kind of just take it and do what they're going to do. Um, so I think the big advantage of indie publishing, or at least one big advantage, is you have a little bit more control. But yeah, I think there, there are pros and cons to each. But I was definitely fortunate to be able to get my book easily into bookstores and that sort of thing. Well, that's good. And we've talked primarily about podcasting on the Metaphor.inc uh, presentations that we've done. But you've actually been in bookstores. You've done maybe festivals or seminars or whatever. Could you talk about some of those other ways to market your book? Yeah, so there, you know, we've talked a lot about marketing, um, and you start, as I said earlier, with the communities that you're engaged with. Uh, that's that's the first people that you're actually talking to about your book when it's going to come out. Um, one of the ways I think it's helpful to market is to have an advanced reader team, and y'all may know what I'm talking about here. But uh, mm. these are the people that are going to um, you're going to give a free book to. Uh, or you're going to put it up on NetGalley and you're going to have people in the community, uh, in the worldwide community, read it. Uh, and they're going to leave reviews up on your book before it ever hits the publish date. And that helps generate some enthusiasm for your book. And sometimes they're called street teams. Uh, but what I did was I ordered 100 advanced reader copies of my book and I put physical copies in the hands of these people. Um, and they loved reading it. And putting up reviews and it helped uh, it, on my novel, it helped generate enough enthusiasm that within a month, uh, BookBub uh, agreed to run a, a deal on the book. Uh, you don't know how BookBub works, but BookBub is, is the discount online deal. And what they'll do is they'll uh, put your book up for free to their two, 20 million people. And then they download it uh, for this one week period. Mm. Um, and then they leave reviews. So 20 million people download your book. You might get, I got like 500 reviews of the book in about four week period of time, right? So um, I didn't make much money off of it, but I got a lot of exposure. So 
That's one way to market is to tie into BookBub, get your profile set up on BookBub, which is free to do, put your books up on BookBub and start following other authors on BookBub. And then it's interesting, every time I've only got about 200 followers on BookBub, if you sign up, go follow me. <laughs> but, you know, uh, whenever my book, whenever one of these books releases now each month, they send out an email to the 200 people that are following me on BookBub. If I get more followers, the next time I write a book, you know, they'll send out. So that's kind of free. Uh, Facebook doesn't do that, right? They squash. When you put up something about your recent release on Facebook, you got to pay money, right, to get it out there. Anyway, that's one way to do it. The other way is to um, is to agree to speak to groups, you know, uh, about topics that relate to your book, but are not your book, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So if you've written historical fiction, you're not talking about your book or buy my book, you're going to an organization. I've now spoken to seven chapters of the Daughters of the American Revolution on the historical aspects of my mystery novel that happens to have this historical component to it. So hmm. as you find, you, you and this is what a book publicist does. This is what Hannah, our co-host, will do. They'll read your book and they'll try to find the things in the book that are interesting to talk about. It might be a character's proclivities about something. Maybe there's something in their past that's important uh, that relates to a, a, a popular culture. And that's the thing you go on a podcast and talk about. Oh, by the way, tell us about your book, you know, kind of thing. You're not leading with the book. You're leading with something that the that, that particular organization, like if, if, if I had something about metaphysics in my book, right, I would reach out to you not to talk about daily decorations, but to say, hey, I've covered this topic a little bit. I'm happy to come on and talk about that mm -hmm. issue. You find those organizations that might be interested in something that relates to your book. And then there are festivals that do the same thing. There might be a mystery festival. There might be a historical fiction festival. There might be a metaphysics. I don't know if there is or not. But, yeah. you know, or go start one. That's the, There you go. Go have a festival that involves that. And all your friends come and you invite people and you start something. You maybe have it annually. But you create these uh, environments in which people can get together. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there are other things that, I mean, we did a lot of creative things. I think bookstores are fine, uh, but people don't like to go out late at night now and go to a bookstore for a reading. But I'll tell you where they will go. They'll go to a bar, mm -hmm. go to a brewery. That's where I had most of my events. Here's another tip. Don't just go by yourself. I had like eight events um, where it was a co-authored event and I would find another mystery writer who had a book that had just come out and we would interview each other. They mm. bring their people, I bring my people, the, the bookstore brings their people or the event brings their people and you have more going on than just Landis's book, right? I'm, pro I'm, I'm promoting their book, they're promoting my book, it's a lot easier talk about somebody else's thing and a lot better if they talk about your thing than if you talk about your thing. So that's another good technique, I think, about promoting your book. And there are these things you can do with, uh, you know, these giveaways where you get together with groups of writers and you get bundles of books and y'all could do a bundle of metaphysical books, you know, mm. and put them out through a book bub giveaway or something or a Facebook giveaway or, you know, that, by the way, Giving away your book is a great way to sell your book. It doesn't make any money, but it, 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 it's a great way to get people interested in what you're writing, right? And that's another way. Giving giving things away uh, is important. Um, I like the in-person deals, but I think, you know, the video stuff as well. And try to get on podcasts, um, you know. But, you know, when you go on a podcast, go with a purpose and, have, and, and listen to their podcast before you go on it. We've had... And we've had some people that pitch our podcast that I don't think you've ever listened to it. You know, mm -hmm. we can sniff that out pretty easily, you know, but there are other people that we know would fit and um, ask them to be on the show. And they're usually a pretty engaging guest, but it shouldn't be about you. It shouldn't be about the book. It should be about what you can offer to that particular media outlet, which means what are their listeners interested in and try to give that to them. Right. And this is what I wanted to say earlier is that most of the people in this genre, they don't necessarily sell their books. They sell conferences and seminars. Right. Yeah. And uh, you may only be able to get $20 for your book, but you can get right. 250 or $500 okay. for a half day or a full day yeah. workshop. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people will say the same thing that they wrote about 
that uh, they'll charge 10 times as much or 20 times as much. And people will pay that when they won't pay the 20 bucks just they to won't get buy your book. But they'll pay for your yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think are, a lot of, oh, okay. I, I was going to say, and there are metaphysical uh, festivals or whatever all around. Uh, there was one big one here in Charlotte. Uh, it was called Shift Charlotte. And I think there's a big one in Raleigh. Uh, but Shift Charlotte would get like six or 700 people. They were at the Shriners wow. Hall in uh, North Charlotte up here. Uh, but uh, it was running for a number of years. It got shut down by COVID. But uh, there's another big one in Raleigh, and they do have you know big ones all around. And they have book authors who sell there, but I don't know how successful they are. So, I, yeah, I know some people may know and be able to to say yes or no, but I don't know if it's as successful as being a speaker or or having a conference or a workshop. Yeah, I go. Oh, go ahead. I just attended. Um, it was called a holistic expo in Salem, Virginia, and there were I was uh, I had a booth there and everything, and I was doing readings, but I also had the book. There were a couple of authors there and there was some interest, um, but, uh, you know, there were probably a thousand people that came through there and it was, you know, the main thing I used it for was uh, email addresses. I mean, you really can harvest connections when you go to something like that. Um, and I do think speaking is one of the major ways to get a book out there from our genre um, and to to introduce yourself as a writer. Yeah. So much of this, I think, points to that idea we talked about that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Like a lot of the efforts that you might make to promote your book are not necessarily going to show an immediate return. Um, and it can be hard if you're if you're focused on the numbers and focused on kind of well, what's the return on investment for this particular ad that I put out or this event that I went to or this podcast that I did. It, it's really, really hard to quantify those things. And you might not see immediate tangible results from different marketing efforts that you do. Um, but it's cumulative, you know, and the more you write, the more books you put out. We've had authors say that the best uh, thing for their backlist is a new book coming out. Once you have a new book, then that hopefully gets you new readers who will then look at your backlist and, and purchase books from that, especially if you have books that are a series or, you know, connect to each other in some kind of way. Um, so I think it's it's a long term process and it can be a little bit frustrating sometimes as a writer because you feel like I'm doing all these things. And I don't really know what's going to work or if any of this is actually getting the attention. But if you're consistent about it, I think it builds up over time. Yeah. And another good point about this is books are forever. You know, I, I buy books that are 100 years old that people have written, you know, and it's a big difference from um writing for a, a journal or a magazine or something, or even a newspaper is, you know, people will read it and toss it and it's gone in a month or a year. But uh, books are around for years and decades and centuries. And I could even ask people, you know, from your college days, do you have your yearbook? And do you have copies of your uh, student uh, newspaper? You know, most people have their yearbook, but they don't have their student newspaper or their, maybe their literary magazine. They have that because it's perfect bound, but a lot of people don't have the things that are less tangible and a book is very tangible. Yeah, that's a great point. That's one thing I like about books. So may I say something? Yeah, go ahead, Happy. Okay, I had to jump off for a second uh, to take a, a call, but so I hope this wasn't already said and I missed it, but I'm a new writer. I'm in the process of writing my first book now. And I have been searching on YouTube to, to try to figure out how to do this. So um, I'm, I'm asking you all, this is what I'm doing. So can you tell me if this is the best way to do it and what your advice is? So I'm writing my book in Google Docs. And then I saw on YouTube after I write it in Google Docs, then I just upload it to Kindle Create and that uploads it to Amazon and then I can sell it on Amazon. <laughs> is that is that how it goes? Is that the best place to write your book in Google Docs? So I write it on you know from my phone as I get moved to and I get ideas. I just open my phone and write it. Um, I do have Microsoft Word as well, but you know that's on my computer so I don't write in there. 
see, I guess this is the absolute bare basics of, of how to do this. Can you help me? Uh, yeah, so I think Sarah and I are going to be experimenting with Google Docs. I haven't done it before, mm -hmm. but we're going to try to co-write a project together there. I, I would say that uh, the only step I would add to that process is um, that when you finish writing it on Google Docs, the work has just begun because then you're starting into the revision process and it would be good to get uh, beta readers and uh, yeah. maybe hire an editor to look at your work before you and then work on their feedback before you uh, go to the process of formatting it and putting it up on uh, Amazon. There, You can learn, obviously, the process to do that, or you can pay somebody who knows how to format you know, both the print versions and the ebook versions. I chose because it was very cost effective to have someone do the formatting for me uh, because they could do it more quickly, uh, both in print uh, and ebook. And they used a program called Vellum, V E L L U M, mm -hmm. which apparently is a very intuitive program when it comes to formatting your work for uh, EPUB, I think it is, um, and also for print. And so I, that's just, I would add those steps to the process um, and give yourself a breather when you finish and then come back to it a month later and read it again. Make a few more edits uh, before you finalize it uh, and put it out there. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, unless there's some kind of external pressure to get your work up by a certain date, um, I know it might be tempting to want to upload it as soon as it's done, but if you can give yourself a little bit of time to both for yourself to take time away from it and then come back and maybe make a few edits. Cause I know for me, like if I write something and then I take a few weeks or a month off and I look at it again, I always see things that I want to change that I didn't notice the first time around. So giving yourself a little bit of time to, to look at it, but also to get like Landis was saying, like other readers or an editor to look at it too. Um, there's no reason to rush, you know, you might as well take that time and uh, make sure that you're happy with it before you upload it. And Happy, this would be a good time for us to talk about an anthology that Metaphor.inc is getting ready to come out with. Uh, we want to publish it in August or September of this year, but we want to give budding writers and the spirituality and metaphysical genres the opportunity to get published without the hassle of going through all the intricacies of publishing or uh, having to come up with enough content to write a full book. So we have a workshop scheduled in June, and Leslie will talk a little bit more about that. But uh, we have a deadline of August 13th to do a final submission of a 2,000-word maximum uh, anthology submission, where it, we get published as an ebook on Amazon later on in August or in September. But then you could say you're a published author. And we want to have uh, 15 anthology or 15 uh, submissions in the first anthology, but we want to make this a regular uh, occurrence for people in the community so that they can get some get their feet wet with publishing. And Leslie, if you could talk a little bit more about the workshop. Sure. So Patrice Gaines, who's an award-winning um, author and former journalist for the Washington Post and several other magazines is leading the workshop for us. It's limited to 10 people. I don't know how many people are there, but I would suggest if you're interested to sign up. The cost of the workshop is $50 and that includes a 1500 word edited version. Um, and what Patrice will ask us to do is submit a 500 word uh, writing sample so that she can gauge the level of expertise and tailor the workshop to the people. Yeah. Then on um, the workshop will be three hours long and she'll address the issue she identified with this 500 page, uh, 500 word writing sample. And then she'll do an edited content editing for, for the 1500 words. And then uh, we will do editing on the back end of that uh, to make sure that it's grammatically correct and all of the good stuff that we would want to um, uh, ensure that we are having good content that we put out and then it'll be published. So it's an amazing opportunity uh, because uh, for myself, I can tell you that hiring an editor is extremely expensive 
and getting that level of feedback uh, is really priceless. So if you're at all interested, I will definitely put the link to the registration page here and uh, you can find it on the website, but I'll, I'll put that in, in the chat. Yeah. So I think this is really a great opportunity for those of us who um, would like to start writing uh, and maybe need a little bit more confidence. Yeah, and Leslie, I just put it in the chat. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, you're welcome. So, Happy, yeah. do you have any questions about the anthology? Um, anthology. Well, it, it's will give you an opportunity to write a chapter for a book as opposed to writing an entire book. And you can submit 1,500 words if you participate in this workshop and uh, a 1,500 word essay. Patrice will do content editing for it and give it back to you so you can make changes. And then we have a 2,000 word maximum on the submission for the anthology on August 13th, I think, is the deadline. But her workshop is going to be in June. So you'd have a chance to get something edited, which, as Leslie was saying, was very expensive normally to do and have the opportunity to get published in uh, an ebook. Oh, God, yes, I'm interested in that. And so I, I can submit my book that I'm already writing and for in this or do I have to create something new? Um, would, go ahead. But, Okay, what I would suggest is if you could take a chapter of your book mm -hmm. that is in and of itself um, a co complete story, so you may need to add a little bit at the beginning and end or whatever uh, okay. to make it a story, then that would enable you to get uh, feedback on what you're writing in the context of your book. So that might be one approach you take. Oh, I love yeah. that. And, and the title of the anthology is Spiritually Profound Experiences, and we wanted people to have the ability to talk about any personal experiences that they had. That's the, the whole reason for that broad topic, but uh, well, write about things you've personally experienced. Okay. Okay, so this would be the, uh, this is what the other gentleman was suggesting when he said, I'm taking notes get a, a write my book then uh, the gentleman and the young lady take a month away and then come back and look at it then get an editor and all of that you all are saying if i take this workshop then that's like more bang for my book because i right yes it would be a tool in your writer's toolbox and i need tools in my toolbox so okay <laughs> And, and Patrice will give you three hours of, you know, commentary on how to write, you know, well and to write things that are interesting to readers is what we've been saying here. Uh, she'll give you some good pointers along the way. She gives a uh, half day or six hour workshops and she charges about 10 times as much. And she's really charging for her time to do the editing, the content editing on this 1500 word submission more so than the workshop. She's uh, helping us along with uh, Leslie and I are, are doing stuff on the back end to help get this anthology out as inexpensively as we can. So, but it's really going to be a service for the members of Metaphor.inc. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before we, I just wanted to say one thing about the, all the links that are up in chat. Um, it's important, I think, to keep those because often I've sent several people to Consciousness Cafe to try to find metaphor.inc and they come away saying they can't find it. So if you just use the links that are up in chat exactly, the Consciousness Cafe backslash metaphor.inc, it will get you there. But if you go to Consciousness Cafe and try to find it, sometimes you can't. <laughs> so, so okay. Sheila, um, yeah. it's in the menu, uh, top menu, but if you're accessing it from your phone, yeah. you'd have to drop down that uh, little hamburger. So now I'm thinking we need a little banner on the home page. So I will take care of that. Well, good. Leslie, Leslie's fantastic with mm -hmm. WordPress. She's just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Oh, Mark, I think you're on mute if you're talking. Uh, I was going to say, I'll put the links on the YouTube channel too, so that people will be able to get that. That's one thing we haven't been doing 
and really should be doing more of. So thanks, Sheila, for that as well. So we've we've come to the end of our time here, and I think we've had a great conversation. I want to thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Landis, for being here with us. And I hope you've gotten some things from us as much as we've gotten from you, but we really appreciate the time you've been able to spend with us. Thank yeah. yeah, thanks for having us. This has been fun. Yeah, listen to the podcast. You might uh, hear some good advice from some of our authors. Uh, we try to pick their brains. We're trying to steal all their good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> there you or go. download our, our first book for free, too, if you're yeah, interested yeah. in just flipping through the ebook. Yeah, check it there out. And uh, I'll have a link to their books, the Right Quote series uh, in the YouTube channel content. So uh, look for it there as well. So thanks, everybody, for your attendance this evening and hope to hear from you again soon. Take care. Thanks, thanks Sarah. Bye. Thanks, Landis. Bye. 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 Bye.